CME Info's continuing education and board certification programs bring the conference to you. The following is a video sample from the University of Washington School of Medicine's Radiology Review Course. This excerpt is from course director, Dr. Michael Richardson's lecture titled, MRI of Large Joints. Which protocol should you use to image a joint? Well, it depends. Like so many important things in life, it just depends. Here's what I would urge if you're new at this, then I would urge starting off simply. You can't go far wrong if you just did PD fat satin stir in all three planes. That would cover most things in joint imaging. We could stop right here and say that that's plenty on protocoling, but let me add one little refinement. If you give some blanket uh, recipe like this to your text, they will just go down the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six. When actually maybe you should refine it a little bit, maybe you should think about what if we could only have one sequence? What if we had to worry about, say, the building catching on fire or an earthquake? Or more likely, the patient freaking out because they don't like the tight spaces? Or, more likely, they came in because they have joint pain. They've been lying there for 30 minutes and it really hurts, so they start quivering. So maybe you should move certain sequences up to the front of the line, have a key sequence. Okay, what are the key sequences? Well, it depends what you're looking for. If you're looking for pathology, STIR would be keen. If you're looking for cartilage, PD is great, anatomy T1. Then how about the imaging plane? Again, it depends on what you're looking at. If you're looking at the knee, sagittal is usually the sweet plane. If, that, if you could only get a PD fat set in the sagittal plane, that would diagnose an awful lot of knee abnormalities. Coronal plane would rule. So eventually, after you've developed your own protocols, you may end up with books of them like this, with complex recipes of every specific factor. Now, even if you have a book like this, it's good to remember that these are suggestions, not laws of the universe. How many people have been in the military? When you go in there and they issue your uniform, did it fit? You look like a size 37. Well, maybe I'm not. Maybe it doesn't fit. That's how these things are. Buying off the rack does not automatically give you a good fit. There's one thing on there that I am pretty religious about. That's this part right here. Place a marker over the thing that hurts, or over a scar, or over the mass. This little rule right here can save your butt a zillion times. Let's talk a little bit about metal protocol. I work part of the time at Harborview Medical Center where almost every other patient looks like this, literally. If they have to have an MR, how should the protocol differ there? Well, metal, the main problem about metal is that it can induce an incredibly high local magnetic field, especially if you have ferromagnetic metal in there. Even if you don't have ferromagnetic metal, it's still gonna distort the field. Now, why, what do we rely on to make nice looking images MR? We rely on homogeneity, and this is working directly against us. Generally, when we do MR of anything, we want to get t sort of a T1-ish looking image and sort of a T2-ish image. It turns out certain of those uh, flavors of those are more or less sensitive. Plain vanilla Spinaco T1 is fairly insensitive to metal. A plain vanilla Stir is fairly insensitive to metal. Whereas if you take some other kind of uh, T2 sequence, like a T2 fat set, that's very sensitive to field inhomogeneity. So this forms the basis of our metal protocol, a T1 and STIR in the different planes. Another factor, this kind of artifact is more significant the higher the field strength goes. So if you're one of those fortunate people that has a zillion different magnets, and you could choose, hmm, should we go with the 0.3 or the 1.5? Or maybe I'll have one of those 3.0s. Well, the lower the field strength, the less the artifact. How about GAD? In particular GAD, we do use in certain circumstances. If you're gonna use intra-articular GAD, you wanna to try to adjust the concentration of it so that cartilage and GAD look different. That's sort of the holy grail. That's the reason we're giving it. So do we use it in the shoulder? I wish we could use it in all of our shoulders, but our uh, referring physicians don't always want it. Some of them feel strong, oh no, I don't care about that labrum. That can't be a labrum problem. This is just a rotator cuff. Okay, fine. So some, we do get a number of patients that we do not get contrast in. The hip, if you're looking at labrum there, you really, really need it. Of course, in the hip, in the context of trauma, other than labrum, you probably don't. The knee, we rarely give it, mostly only if we're worried about, uh, for example, patients had a meniscal repair, and they're wondering, hmm, is it healing, or is it retorn? That's tough to tell if you don't have contrast in there, because healing meniscus looks a lot like torn meniscus. Top quality board certification reviews and continuing education programs, guaranteed. 
For more information about this self-study activity, go to www.cmeinfo.com slash 779V or call us at 1-800-284-8433.